can, please. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And we're in this series 7 through 10, year long. We're going to go through Hebrews, God willing. And uh, right now we are in the most complex part of Hebrews, that's chapter 7, and this morning we are in the most complex part of that chapter, uh, starting at verse 11 through the remainder of the chapter. And uh, let me just start with this question. How many people here know how to start a fire? Anybody here know how to start a fire? Who does that at your house? I, uh, our, our neighbors have uh, taken to teasing me that I don't know how to do anything, because I mean, they, I just never work on our house. I just, I don't, I, mean, I don't even know if we own a hammer, you know? And, and uh, But this week, Kathy told me, I think the reason why, it's, it's kind of sad when your wife has to point this stuff out to you, I think the reason why we don't have any hot water is because the pilot lights out in the water heater. I was like, huh, that makes sense. So I fired down to the basement, you know, and laid down there on the concrete on my stomach. I'm looking inside this thing. Huh, there's no flame. So I'm, have you ever done this? You know when you got to hold the thing? How many people have done this? You got to hold the thing down, you're messing around with it. It took me like about seven tries. It's not that complicated, but anyway, that's what I'm all about. And I finally got it going, the flame, poof, the whole thing lights up. We have hot water again, and I know how to start a fire. Do you know how to start a fire? Well, here's a different question. Do you know how to start a fire um, in your marriage? I'm not talking about a fire storm here, all right, of conflict and controversy. Most people have that down. I'm talking about, do you know how to start a fire in your marriage? I mean, we've been going along for a while, and we need like a fresh a passion for one another, and just fire it up again, because a uh, week from tomorrow, boys, do you know? Valentine's Day, that's the kind of side action input you can get here at Harvest, all right? So make a little mental note of that. Uh, Valentine's Day is coming up. Do you know how to start a fire in your marriage if you have the privilege of being married? Then it is a privilege. Man, I serve you up all these premium opportunity for brownie points, and you don't even like. Anyway, okay, all that to say this, I know how to start a fire. I think I know how to start a fire in a marriage. Let me ask you, do you know how to start a fire in your faith? Do you know how to sort of get to the place spiritually like, wow, it was going so great, and now it's a little more static and plateaued and regular and routine and, and, and a Wow, there's like cactuses growing in my faith now and a little dry out here. And do you know how to get back to the lush green valley? Do you know how to, to use a different picture? Do you know how to start a fire in your faith? Because what we're learning in Hebrews chapter 7 is, is it isn't always the way you'd think. The real way you start a fire in your faith is you get your eyes back on Jesus Christ and what he's done. This whole message is about Jesus Christ and what he's done. And you let God stir it up in your heart again. There's just the awesomeness of the provision that's been made for us spiritually. That's how you start a fire spiritually. Are you ready? All right. Well, this Pastor Rick's prayed for us already. And I'm going to jump in if you say jump. All right. Look at verse 11 of Hebrews 7. Now, this passage is so complex, I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm just going to expound the text. For the next few minutes, no points, no application, no nothing. We're just going through the text. You don't even hardly need to look up the whole time. Just get your eyes on a Bible. Or if you don't have a Bible, we put some of the scripture even up on the screen. But, but we're going to go right through it, a verse, a phrase at a time. Expounding the text. That's what this section is called, all right? Expounding the text. And we're just going to go through it a verse at a time. Look at verse uh, 11. It says this. Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek. Now, a priest, which is used repeatedly in this passage, let's make sure we have a good idea in our mind of what a priest actually is. Do you know what a priest is? A priest is a person who's been given the responsibility to get other people to God. And that's the end of it right there. That's the whole thing. A priest is a person who's been given the responsibility to get other people to God. What do cooks do? They cook. What do athletes do? They compete. What do instrumentalists do? They play. What do priests do? They get people to God. That's their job. Some people are doing a lousy job of it. Some priests are doing a good job of it. That's what priests do. They get people to God. What do priests do? All right. Now, if perfection, that means completion, maturity, uh, if uh, get to the goal, the goal of all faith is to get mankind to God. And if that uh, was uh, attainable through the Levitical priesthood, Leviticus, remember Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, that lays out all God's prescription for the priesthood. What do priests do again? 
to get people to God. The Levitical priesthood, if you could have got to God through the Levitical priesthood, for under it people received the law, what's the law? The law was the priesthood's only tool to get people to God. And it was doing a really bad job, okay? The law was God's uh, sort of 1400s BC, God's prescription for human behavior. Uh, Jewish scholars suggest that the law uh, can be summarized in 618 commands. And they were very complex, all right? So uh, this, is, this is how you get to God. You keep these 618 rules. Are you doing it? Because they're really complex. Can you keep 618 things in your mind all at the same time? Do this and this and this and this and exactly this and not that and always this. Except on Thursdays, then do this. I'm telling you, it was not working for anybody. It was so complex. That's why we had to have a change. Because if perfection had have been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek? We talked about him last week. Okay? And uh, he was the one priest before Abraham who is the picture of Jesus who replaced the Old Testament law. What need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? We would have got just another one of the Old Testament priests, but it wasn't working, so we needed a new plan. Verse 12. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Okay, the two go hand in hand. Priesthood and the law. Priest, what do priests do again? They get people to God. The law was their mechanism for accomplishing that. They're like Laurel and Hardy. They're like James and Kathy. They go together, all right? And the priesthood and the law. That's what he's saying. When there's a change in the priesthood, there's necessarily a change in the law as well. Verse 13, for the one of whom these things are spoken, that's Jesus, he's the one. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe. Remember tribes? There was Abraham, there was Isaac, there was Jacob. Jacob had how many sons again? I was going to count. How many? Twelve. And each one of them became a tribe in the nation of Israel. All the priests came from his son Levi. If you were born in the family of Levi, you could be a priest. If you weren't, you couldn't. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe. Okay, so Jesus isn't from the tribe of Levi. What tribe is he from again? Judah from which no one has ever served at the altar. Jesus is the first priest, the first one whose job was to get people to God. Jesus is the first priest that wasn't from the tribe of Levi. Verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord, oh, there it is. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. Do you know anything about Judah in the Old Testament? I don't know how I would have answered that last week, but I got to study it all week. And one of the really cool things about Judah was, was that when the children of Israel, remember Joseph went down to Egypt and all his brothers came down and, and, and uh, there was a huge issue because Joseph's younger brother, the youngest in the whole family, was like daddy's favorite. And, and uh, you can read the whole story, but you'll, if you know it, you'll remember that there was this point of risk where they thought they were going to lose Benjamin and, and Joseph was going to keep him. And one person stepped forward and says, let him go or his father will die. I will stay in his place. I will put myself as surety for him. Who do you think did that? Judah. Isn't that kind of cool that Jesus is from that tribe? Because that's what Jesus did, didn't he? He said, I'll stand in their place. I love that picture of verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. Five books Moses wrote in the Old Testament. Never mentioned anything. About. His whole point is this. Things are changing. Things are changing. There's a different a program that's underway. Verse 15 says... This became, becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek. Now, the reality of change is more obvious when the new arrives. You can think for a while that things aren't changing, but when the new arrives, then you know things are changing. We uh, uh, had announced this week uh, downtown a new president at Moody. And I've been so excited about Dr. Stoll joining our staff, and I've been thinking how phenomenal that's going to be and what a blessing that's going to be to our church, but... It never really struck me till this week that he's not going to be the president of Moody anymore. And, and it's like when the new arrives, well, I can't say it any better than that. The reality of change becomes more obvious when the new arrives. And that's what was happening with Jesus. Now that he's the new priest on the scene, now that he's the one that gets people to God, everybody's like, wow, everything is going to be so different. Verse 16. Well, I'll read from 15. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest 
not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent. That's how you became a priest in the Old Testament. Didn't matter how much you loved God, didn't matter how much you wanted to serve at the temple, didn't matter, didn't matter. Bottom line, born in the wrong family, can't be a priest, period. What do you think of that? And so Jesus was not made a priest on that basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. Jesus gets to be a priest because he's God. All in favor of God doing whatever he wants? All right. Not on the basis of legal requirement, bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. Verse 17, for it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I like that idea that uh, Jesus is a priest forever. Now, he's going to start summarizing, just write by 18 and 19 in your Bible, summary. If you're having trouble following it, you can follow this. Put summary there. If you've got one of the church Bibles, write it in for sure. Summary. Here it comes, verse 18. On the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and its uselessness. The former command is the law. And you've got to know what a shocking statement that was to the entire nation of Israel. That the law, hey, 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 so what do you think about the law? Well, it's weak and useless. That's what I think of it. Oh, well, uh, you seem to have a fairly formulated opinion. Yes, on the basis of God's word, Hebrews 7, 18 says that the former commandment is set aside because of its weakness. That word means deficiency of all kinds. It's the opposite of strong and capable. In other words, the law wasn't doing the job. What's the job of a priest? Get people to God. What's the, what's the tool they were given? The law. Give the rules. That'll get people to God. And it was not doing a good job. In fact, the second word there, useless, means unprofitable. The term is actually investment language. If you know anything about investment, then you know what ROI is. And the return on investment, as far as the law is concerned, hold up the universal symbol for the ROI of the law. Nada. Okay? Wasn't helping anybody. How many people would be in heaven because the law got them there? Zero. ROI, zero. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, Romans 3.20, God did. For by the works of the law, Romans 3.20, shall no flesh be justified. All right. On the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. There it is, verse 19. For the law made nothing perfect. Nothing. But on the other hand, on the one hand, on the other hand, I love that. Here's the summary. On the one hand, useless. On the other hand, here's the first good news in the passage. A better hope. It's like the sun just came out. Isn't it? A better hope is introduced through which we... You might underline that in your Bible. Draw near to God. That is an amazing thing to hear. That God doesn't want to keep us at a distance anymore. He wants us to draw near to him. I'll come back to that. Just lean over your neighbor and say he's coming back to that part. All right, I'm coming back to that. Verse 20. And it is not without an oath for those who formerly became priests who were made such without an oath. What's an oath? It's like, it's like a, like, what's the word for that? Um, like a promise. But what's, what's something stronger than a promise? Like, like a covenant, that's good. Or it's like a vow, you know, where you, where you like, I don't want to say you swear because we don't do that. Um, you let your yes be no and your no be no. But it's just like, I am doing this. It's an oath. And in the Old Testament, you didn't have to make an oath. You just had to say who your mama was. Oh, okay, well, you could be a priest then. But this one was made a priest, Jesus, with an oath by the one who said to him, now that God the Father shows up, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Now that's such an encouraging thing because what they might have tended to think and what we might tend to think, well, okay, Jesus is God's plan for now, but maybe God's going to have a new plan and then we'll be on to something else and what's the latest and so on and so on. Do you know what I'm saying? Sort of like Windows. When I thought when Windows 95 came out, I thought this is it. I'll figure this out and I'll be all set till 97, 98. What's the, net, what's the latest thing now? Windows XP? It just never stops. You just get used to one out with the next one. Jesus is entirely not like that. All right? That's why the Lord gives an oath and says, has sworn, you see it? It's pretty strong language. Will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. That's why Jesus, verse 22, is the guarantor of a better covenant. Do you know what a guarantor is? A guarantor is a person who takes the guarantee and if you've ever tried to return something to the store because it broke, and you get there and, and, the store, and the business is bankrupt, how good is the guarantee if there's no guarantor? It's worthless. That's why the guarantee is rooted in who made it. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Verse 23. 
The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. That's what it was like in the Old Testament. You just get attached to one priest. What do priests do again? They get you to God, right? And, and in the Old Testament, you'd be like, where's my priest? They're like, oh, he died. You've got to have this new guy now. And like, oh, wow, just getting attached to the old guy. And, and now I've got to have a new guy. And it was just changing all the time. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But Jesus holds his priesthood, what's the next word? Permanently. And all God's people said, permanently. Because he continues forever. Consequently, I love those parts in the Bible. I always say all that to say this. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Those who draw near to God, how? Through him. That's what priests do. They get you to God. And if you try to draw near to God through him, that's going to work out really good for you. If you try to draw near to God, self-styled on your own program, that is a very bad plan. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I will also come back to that. Verse 26. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, Holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. What a great picture of Jesus. Can I just read that again? This is him. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need. Why was it important for Jesus to be sinless? Because if he wasn't sinless when he died on the cross, he'd have been paying for his own sins. But because he is holy and innocent and unstained and separated from sinners, he can die and pay for your sins and mine. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all, a big theme in Hebrews, when he offered up himself. God was like, you are guys, you're priests, and, and this law is messing things up so bad. God's like, I'm just going to come take care of this myself, and he did. For the law appoints, verse 28, men in their weakness as high priests. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son. Love that. Ta-da! A son. Who has been made perfect forever. All right. That's expounding the text. Now, extracting the principles. Are you with me? Because God's word is, is uh, not just to be understood. God's word is to be applied. Am I right? I want to just study God's word. No, isn't that neat? Now I learned some things. Now I know some stuff. Why do we study God's word? We study God's word to be changed. And so let's get some principles. Have you got your pen ready? Jot these down. All right? Extracting the principles. Here's the first one. Religion makes us fearful. Down with religion. That's what I should have called this message. Da religion, you know, the Old Testament human priesthood and all of that stuff, it just makes us fearful. In fact... A dear friend of mine uh, this week said to me, uh, one of my neighbors actually, she said to me that she was offended uh, because she heard someone attack her religion. I was like, oh, don't ever be offended when someone attacks your religion. Just thank them. And, and she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, being offended that someone attacked your religion is being offended like being offended because a doctor attacked your cancer. All right? Religion is death. It's everything that we want to be done with. All right? Religion is like a ladder. And shame on those of you who thought that we left this ladder out here by mistake. So this is religion. It's like, whoa, whoa, there's God way up there. And, and here I am way down here. I better figure out some ways to get to God. Tell me, give me some religious ways to get to God. I'm going to do good works. Nice job. I love when the right people sit in the front row. And, and, and yeah, good works like... Uh, going to church and, and, uh, and um, uh, trying to be good and uh, lighting candles. And how many times am I supposed to say that prayer again? Three million times. And that's religion, okay? It's just doing stuff, doing stuff that I think. And then you get up a little bit into religion and you're like, wow, I don't even feel much closer to God. The Bible says you are God in heaven and here am I on earth. It's a religion can't get us to God. A bunch of man-made stuff and regulations, not even in the Bible, trying so hard. God bless people for the sincerity. But sincerity doesn't get you to God. Trying hard doesn't get you to God. 
down with religion. Let's vote. Down with religion. All right? It doesn't do anything to help people. A religion only, as I said, makes us fearful. Speaking of fearful, I better get off this ladder. And religion only makes us fearful because we always wonder, is it enough? Have I done enough? Is, is God happy with me? Is he smiling right now? It doesn't feel like he's smiling. I wonder if he's smiling. I hope he's smiling. Maybe I should try harder. Maybe I should go to church every day. Maybe I should, what can I do? I'm going to show him I'm serious. I'm going to impress God. That's religion, okay? And it's awful. Do you know the entire Old Testament? F.F. F. Bruce said this, the entire apparatus of the Old Testament is calculated to peop, keep is calculated to keep God at a distance. If you think about everything in the Old Testament, just think about the temple. What do you know about the temple? Okay, well, where was it, first of all? Tell me, do you know where the temple was? It was in Jerusalem. Okay, well, what if you didn't live in Jerusalem? There wasn't exactly a metro train you could take uh, to the place of worship. God's like, I'm in Jerusalem if you're not too bad. That's kind of rough. And then, you know, when you got to Jerusalem, I mean, you could see the temple because where is it? on a mountain and even if you could climb up on the mountain when you get there there's a huge wall around it a big wall too uh, 1500 feet by a thousand feet the equivalent of um, I wrote down some humongous 350 football fields okay there's a big wall around the temple and nobody was allowed in in fact uh, only uh, those who were converted to Judaism or born into it were allowed inside the temple there was a sign that you would see there that said uh, if caught inside the temple, you have only yourself to blame for your death. That's kind of like stand back a little bit, don't you think? And then even if you were allowed to come inside, you're in the outer court. Or even if you were uh, Jewish, you were allowed the women. There's a court of the women. They're only allowed so far. And even the men, the practicing righteous uh, Jews were allowed a little closer. But they still weren't even in the temple. Only the priests were allowed in the temple. Everybody else had to back off a little bit. And if you got inside, uh, only the high priest was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. And he was only allowed to do that, you know, like once a year. So the whole thing was like saying this message. Back off. You're not making it. You, you can't come close to God. And that's why when you see two times in this passage those words, draw near. It's like, what? Yeah, the wall's down. Come on. Come on to God. This is what we have in our new priest the forever high priest, Jesus Christ. God, is a, God has a standard and you're not making it. That's what religion says. Now this will help you out a little bit. And make a note of these. I think I got five things here. You know you're religious if. Okay? This will help you. You know you're religious if every time something bad happens to you, you're kind of like, whoa, I think God's trying to get me. You know, you, you're late for work. Your car breaks down. You're like, oh, that's because I didn't go to church on Sunday or something. You, that's how you know you have religion. If every time something bad happens, you think it's God trying to get you. Here, here's another one. You know you're religious if you're putting your hope in the law. If someone were to say to you, are you going to go to heaven when you die? You say, well, I'm trying hard. If your hope is in the law, the Bible says, cursed is the one who hopes in the law. Okay? You, you, if, you're, if you're like, well, I'm going to try hard, I'm going to keep the rules, I'm going to be a good person, I'm not as bad as my neighbor, they really stink, but I'm pretty good. And as soon as someone says to you, uh, what do you like, you, you know, the first thing you do is you picture yourself on the ladder, and you're like, well, I'm not that close to God, but I can tell you about a lot of people who aren't as far along as I am. And you have your hope in the law. You're trying to impress God with how good you are. And you hear this all the time. This is like the religion of human niceness. How many people heard somebody say about somebody this week, oh, she's so nice. Oh, he's so nice. Have you heard that? That's like human, that's religion, man. I'm so nice. I'm so nice. And I'm not opposed to being nice, by the way. It's just a really bad plan to get into a relationship with God. You know you're religious if your hope's in the law. Here's another one. You know you're religious if God always seems so far away to you. So far away. Here's a fourth one. You know you're religious if you're a slave to certain sins. If the truth were known, there are certain things, you just can't change them. You have uh, a private sin of some kind, an anger or anxiety or addiction of some kind, and, and you just can't get done with it. Just can't get just on. It's your whole story. It's on every page of your life. 
You're a slave to sin. You only have religion. Jesus is setting his followers free. And though not perfect, we have a growing pattern of his transforming influence upon our life. Here's the last one. You know you're religious if you fear death. Okay? Now, do I want to die? No. I don't want to die, but I am not afraid to die. And I hope to see my kids grow up and get married. I have lots of hopes and dreams about the future, but I'm not afraid to die. If you have a religion, you are so afraid to die, and you are holding on to this life because you don't have a clue what's coming in the next one. All right? But if you know Jesus personally, and if you've claimed his promises, then you've got a pretty clear idea that when we get out of this dump, it's going to be amazing. And there's a whole part of you, like the Apostle Paul, is like to live as Christ, to die is gain. And, and those who really have Jesus, this great high priest forever, they're just, they're not afraid to die. And if you are still afraid to die, I'm sorry to tell you, you don't have him, you have religion. Religion makes us fearful. And then the second thing on the other page, re religion makes us failures. If you look at verse uh, 11, now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, you see, it wasn't attainable. All it did was make people fail. That's all the law does is make people fail. Let me ask you a question. How often do you fail? No, you don't tell me. I'm just like asking you. How often? Just think about that for a second. How often do you fail the Lord? I'm told that life expectancy is 77.2 years. How often do you fail the Lord in 77.2 years? 926 months. 28,178 days. How many of those days were days where I failed the Lord? 676,272 hours. How many times did I fail the Lord in 2.5 billion seconds? That's your life expectancy. How many times did I fail the Lord? The Bible says that all have sinned. And uh, that's the law. The law just makes you failure. Just gives you an awareness. Are you making it? Can you, can you please God on your own? Can you keep all the rules? No, you really can't, can you? And if you're not sure about that yet, why don't everybody just stand for a second? We'll just have a little uh, survey here. Everybody stand, and uh, we'll just run through a couple of the Ten Commandments. I don't know, just the ones that occur to me, like, um, okay, this is a little sinner check here. Um, how many people here have ever, um, sit down if you've murdered somebody. Oh, wait now, because Jesus said that if you... Uh, hate a person in your heart, you're a murderer. So if you've ever cultivated hatred towards someone in your heart. All right, now, but stand up and be honest. I've never done that. All right, just, it's just, you don't have to sit down. If, you don't, if you've ever stolen anything ever, you can sit down. Okay, if you've ever lied, you can sit down. And if you aren't sitting down, then there's your first time. Okay. Now, that's like three of the commandments. How are you doing? 618 commandments. And we smile, listen, because of the ludicrousness of thinking that anyone could stand before this holy God. I'm telling you, nobody can stand before this God. Doesn't matter how good you are or what you've done. It is appointed unto man once to die, Hebrews 9, and after that comes judgment. And if you're going to be climbing up into heaven and appearing before God on your religion program, that's going to be like a piece of straw in a blazing fire is how long that'll last. All right? So you definitely need something different than that. Religion makes us failures. In fact, I'm preaching to a room full of failures this morning. Message from a failure to a bunch of failures. You say, well, I love to come to Harvest. We always get that good news. But here's the thing you need to know. The outcomes of religion are fear and failure. And in our hearts they produce these things. Anger. At circumstances. At God. At others. The fear and failure of religion produces guilt. Like a dark cloud. I'm not making it. God's not happy. It produces withdrawal. Stay away from God. Stay away from church. Stay away from Christians. Leave me alone. It produces despair. There's no point to life. It's just some dumb puzzle. And there's a piece missing. And I can't find it. Everybody look up here for a minute. All of those feelings that flow from religion are ordained by God to prepare your heart for the good news that's found in Jesus. All in favor of the good news? All right, here it comes. Relationship gives us hope. 
Relationship is not a man uh, trying to climb up to God, all right? Relationship is God reaching down to man, okay? We don't need to climb up to God. God came down to us. That's the glory of the gospel. God reaching down to man. That's why those two phrases in there, draw near, we can draw near, are amazing things. God with open arms says, come on, I love you, I'll forgive you, I'll receive you. Relationship gives us hope. Relationship gives us hope. Verses 18 and 19, on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because it is weak and useless. The law made nothing perfect. The law got nothing to God. But on the other hand, a better hope. Yeah, I'll say better. As in day and night, amen. A better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And who is the hope? Jesus Christ. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Jesus is the better hope through which we draw near to God. I love that. We can draw near to God. Listen, the Father of Jesus Christ can be your Father too. Do you know that? Do you know that? Listen, look up here. And, and, he, and he loves you. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he first loved us. In this is love, not religiously reaching up to him, but realizing that he has reached down to us. God demonstrated his love toward us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ, what? Died for us. It is an awesome truth, the centerpiece of civilization. Jesus Christ, he loves you. Not only does he love you, but listen, he's reaching out to you. Do you understand? He's reaching out to you this morning. And I can only invite you to consider his invitation. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 says, this is Jesus reaching out to you in love. This is the, the relationship that gives us hope. Jesus reaching out in love says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. How amazing is that? What's he doing? What's he doing? He's knocking on the door of your heart. He's reaching out to you in love. He's like, open the door, open the door. I'll come in. I'll come in. I'll change your life. I'll transform your life. I'll give you a hope and a future like you never dreamed was possible. He's standing at the door knocking. Do you know, growing up in church, I... Remember in our Sunday school, we used to have a, a particular picture, and it's, all, it's, all, it's called Christ at Heart's Door. Let me just show it to you. How many of you have seen that picture before? Flip back, it's actually by a, a, a painter named Warner Salmon, and the entire collection of his life is uh, at Anderson University. And how many people have all seen that picture? Warner Salmon painted that. And then go to the one, um, Christ at Heart's Door. It's an amazing picture, and uh, he painted it with that, Behold, I stand at the door and knock in mind. Notice in the background there the shape of the heart. Do you see it made by the door and then the light of uh, Christ on the wall? And notice the, the little screen that you can see through the door. What, what, what's it like inside that room? It's very dark. See, that's inside us. And to think that Christ comes to the door of our heart and says, I love you. I, I want to be in your life. Will you let me in? Will you, will you invite me in? Listen, not begging, not pleading, as has often been pointed out, Solomon uh, painted the door with no uh, latch on the outside. Do you see that there? He will not bust the door down. He will not force his way into your life. But there he is, persistently knocking. You need me. I'm your only hope. I will forgive you. I will give you the gift of eternal life. I will give you everything your heart has been looking for and longing for. Won't you call out to me? Won't you come to me? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The grace of God which brings salvation has appeared to all men. I believe that Jesus knocks on the door of every human heart. But everyone doesn't open the door. Another painter uh, painted uh, his version. He called it Light of the World. His name was William Holman Hunt. And uh, he painted a very similar picture, Christ at Heart's Door. However, the difference between these two painters painting the same picture based on the same passage of Scripture could not be more different. And I won't go into the details of their lives this morning except to say that Warner Salmon was a devoted follower of Jesus and William Holman Hunt painted that picture because it was popular in his day in the UK to have religious themes. He never opened his life to the Lord. He was not interested in God in his life. He made a lot of money off of that picture, but he never opened the door of his heart to Jesus Christ the Lord. Relationship gives us hope, and lastly, relationship gives us confidence. I've been so excited to get back to verse 25. Notice that it says there, consequently, because of what Jesus has done, the conclusion is this. 
he is able to save to the uttermost. How cool is that? NIV says he's able to save completely. New American Standard says he's able to save forever. And those are both good translations. It's the idea of completeness. I would just say to the max. He is able to save to the max. That's why we have confidence. Relationship gives us confidence. There's no person the Lord cannot reach. Do you understand that? He's able to save to the uttermost. Look at this room here filled with people. Isn't it an awesome thing to think that there's not one person sitting in one row this morning with one experience that Jesus can't penetrate? Isn't that great? He's able to save to the uttermost. He's able to save to the uttermost. Lift up your voice and say that. Go ahead. Now say it together. Ready? He's able to save to the uttermost. That means no matter where you've been in your life, he's able to save to that place. That, that matters no matter who you've become through the choices you've made, he's able to save to the uttermost. You say, well, you don't know what I've done. No, no, that's why you came this morning, so you could hear this good news. He's able to save to the uttermost. Amen? You just think about the most wretched sinner that you can think of. Can Jesus forgive that person? Can he? Is a human being even capable of doing something that if they came in honest repentance, would, would the Lord not forgive them? I tried to think of the most wretched sinner that I could think of, and the first name that came to my mind was uh, David Berkowitz. Anybody? Who, who knows who David Berkowitz is? 1977, a summer of terror in New York City. And the uh, son of Sam, as the press and the police called him, uh, 44 caliber pistol randomly, didn't rob, didn't rape, just walked up to cars or pedestrians on the street, 44 caliber pistol, just randomly killed people, no connection, didn't know them, didn't want anything from them, just wanted to kill them. What's more evil than that? Six people murdered, seven more people wounded in devastating ways, one person lost their eyesight, another person paraplegic for life. Lives devastated and families devastated. Okay, well, God can't forgive him. What? Uttermost. Able to save to the uttermost. Kathy and I were having dinner uh, in New York a couple years ago with uh, Jim Symbol and his wife, Carol. And uh, he just said in a kind of an offhanded way, I was up at the prison this week visiting David Berkowitz. I said, what did you just say? He said, yeah, I was up visiting him in the prison. I said, oh, you're trying to share the Lord with him? He said, no, no, he's been gloriously converted. I said, that can't be. The story unfolded. It's an amazing story. He's been in prison for 25 years, more now. It's about 27. Listen to this. These are his own words. There was a time back in 1987, one cold winter's night when I was in, pri in the prison yard. Another inmate walked up to me, introduced himself, and boldly told me that Jesus loved me. After he said those words, I laughed at him and told him there was no way that God could love me. I told him I was too evil and that he was wasting his time. But this man had such a compassionate heart, and I saw that he was really sincere. I cannot describe it, uh, how he treated me. One day he offered me a small pocket New Testament, which included the Psalms, and he urged me to read it. Some nights I would peek into the Bible just to check it out. I'd never read the Bible before. I started to read the Psalms for the first time in my life and said to myself, my God, these are some of the most beautiful words I've ever read. And I began to cry like never before. I shut my light out, got down on my knees in the darkness, began there in his cell and began to pour out my heart to the Lord. This was all new to me. Feelings of grief and deep remorse welled up inside. I called upon the God of Israel and talked to him as if he were right in the cell with me. I didn't know if God was listening. I just had to pray. And he heard my prayer. Now listen. You say, well, can God forgive a person like that? Oh, he's just, he's just, you know, those people, they get religious when they're in prison. Well, it's interesting. That was 1987. In 2002, on the 25th anniversary of his sentence, he was up for parole. And I have it right here. I won't take time to read it this morning. But he wrote a letter uh, to the governor of um, New York. You can see it right here. And uh, to Governor Pataki. And in the letter, uh, he says, I'm haunted by my actions. I would do anything to undo this tragedy. I know that I failed and disappointed my family and disgraced myself for the rest of my life. However, today, because of Jesus Christ and my faith in him, I'm trying to make my best amends to society in any way that I can. He goes on and refuses parole and writes to him and says, frankly, I can give you no good reason why I should be paroled. Um, 
the loss of six lives and the wounding of even more are reasons enough for me to spend the rest of my life in prison. I accept my punishment. This is a converted person. This is a heart that's been changed by the power of the gospel. Listen, listen. The gospel is so awesome that, that it can save the most wretched of sinners if they come in humility, repentance, and faith. But it's also so awesome that even the person that we would call the best of men is hopelessly lost without it. Relationship gives us confidence. He is able to save to the uttermost. Now just this application and I close. Embracing the application. Let's do something with this, amen? Don't leave me up here. Let's do something with this, amen? amen. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this. Number one, Jesus is the way. Choose him. He's God's only plan for the rest of eternity. Get on the program. Okay? Amen. Jesus is the way. Choose him. As many as have received him, John 1, 12, to those he has given the authority to be called the children of God, to those who call upon his name. It's as simple as that. You don't have to climb some ladder of human performance. You just need to call upon the name of the Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, forgiven. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift. How do you get a gift? I've been wanting to give you this Bible. How do you get a gift? You take it. Okay. When, when's it yours? Is it yours now? Is it yours now? It's yours when you accept it. Choose Jesus Christ. Turn from your sin and embrace him by faith, and your life will be changed for all eternity. Am I telling the truth? Listen, it can happen to you. It can happen to you. Jesus is the way, choose him. And for those who have made that choice, Jesus is the pattern. Follow him. Jesus didn't uh, come just to save you from hell and, and, and give you heaven. And Jesus came to change you here and now, to make you a better dad and, and to make you a better husband and to make you a more honest man in the workplace. And isn't that why Jesus came? Are you following him? We've been talking about this all fall. The people who just want the fire insurance probably don't even have that. It's your life. He's the pearl of great price. You sell everything you have and give it to him. He's the pattern. Follow him. I love the way that's spelled out right here in the text. Notice that it says, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners. He's the pattern. Follow him. And then lastly, Jesus is the one. Worship him. What I'm praying for myself and for our church in these weeks between now and Easter is that God will stir up a fresh passion for Jesus in our hearts. You hear me? By focusing on him, by reminding him, isn't it a glorious thing that you can sit in church and hear things, many of which you've heard and known before, and go, yes, yes, that's who he is, that's why I'm here, that's what life is all about. Are you with me? Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for the joy of proclaiming the unsearchable riches that are found in Jesus. The one who gives us confidence. The one who gives us hope. How dark is this world apart from Jesus? How faithfully he knocks on the door of every human heart. Not forcing, not pushing, but persistently offering all that our hearts have been looking for and longing for. Lord, I pray for some this morning who are turning to him by faith. I pray for some, even in this moment, who might be saying, Lord Jesus, I am sorry for my sin. I know that I have failed you and broken your law, but I turn to you now by faith and ask that you would grant to me the gift of eternal life. I choose you now as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for choosing me. Lord, thank you for lives changed for all of eternity by that choice in this moment. For those of us who know you and love you, we invite you, Lord.